Hello to everyone listening to us. I am Renata, the conference Teverishia host, and our guest today is Pam Leo. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be with you. Thank you to accepting to participate in this conference. Pam Leo is a parent educator, a certified childbirth educator, a doula, a parent, and a grandparent. And now a great grandparent. And now a grand grandparent. Wow. I remember the first time I heard your name. That was an interview with Dr. Laura Markham. And she told us that, you know, everything she needs to know about connection, she learned from you and from your book, Connection Parenting. Ah, uh, so sweet. Yeah. So I how... got to meet her one day. Wow. Yes, I was so excited. How, how did your journey start at the connection? Oh gosh, so many years ago, my daughter is almost 50, my oldest daughter. Um, the very first parenting book that I ever read was How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. And it remains one of my favorites that I recommend to parents and always mention. I think she was three at the time that I discovered it. And once I knew that there was more to know, I, I just became insatiable reader on the topic and just have never stopped. <laughs> and the more and more that I read, then I became a childcare provider. I would share the information I was reading about with my parents and with other childcare providers. And before I knew it, I was speaking to other childcare providers and sharing that information on a bigger way. And it just kept growing. And I thought there should be a way to share this with other parents. So I created it. First, it was a six week course. Then it grew into a seven week course because I realized we can't do all the first six week things unless we're taking care of ourselves. So that was the seventh week that I added. So when I wrote, I taught that class for 16 years before I wrote the book. So that I, what I tried to do is make the book so that someone would feel like they were taking the class. And so that was really the way that I wrote it was based on the class. Uh, before you read that book, um, the Adele Faber book about how to talk to kids so they would listen, how to listen to kids so they would talk, did it like come naturally to you, this connection thing? Or was it like... No. No. <laughs> no, it was not the way I was raised at all. Mo no. Like most of my peers of my generation, that was, you know, we, most of us, I think, grew up with authoritarian parenting of, you know, do as I say, or else, and you did it, even if you didn't know what or else would be. So no. it was a complete change of direction. And because we record everything we ever heard, that's the first thing that comes to our mind and to our mouth when our buttons get pushed. And so, you know, it really took a lot of work. And, you know, I certainly didn't have all this information when my children were growing up. I was gradually accumulating it and trying to make course corrections as I went. But so many parents say to me, I wish I'd had this information from the beginning. And I always say, so do I, <laughs> because I didn't. But I did gradually accumulate it and hopefully my children benefited from it. I think they did. And certainly my grandchildren have benefited from it, but uh, it was very different from how I grew up. But it, it, it felt right, it, you know, it felt right to me. And so I just kept going in that direction. Why, why is that so important to have this connection to our children? Why, why, why yeah, why, why? Well, what I get asked that question a lot. And what I always say is, you know, parents say, well, but coercion works, you know? And mm -hmm. it's like, yes, it does. As long as we are bigger than they are, it works because they know we have all the power. But what will we have for parenting once we're not bigger than they are and they won't sit in time out? Mm -hmm. And what happens when we have connection with our children they care about what we need and what we want. And that's where all of the richness lies in that relationship where we're doing our best to meet their needs. And in so doing, 
they feel connected to us and therefore care about what we need. And, and that gives us influence to try to do life in a way that works for both of us. So I think that if I had to just, you know, capsulize it, it would be that, that they care because they're connected to us about what we need and what we want and what we value, everything. And still, it seems like it feels very scary. Like if I only have to count on connection to regulate my children, mm -hmm. <laughs> it right. seems so scary because like it's like, so this is like no control. So they can do whatever they want. And if they just, you, you know, like we want to have punishment or consequences or, right. or rewards, you know, whatever it is we use with children, we feel like in control. I know where to push and then the result will be that. But now I have to rely on connection and that's it. <laughs> that is a great question. <laughs> no one has put it to me that way before. And I guess, you know, that really is scary. So depending on when you come into the ideas of connection parenting, you know, if we're blessed and we come into it very young, it's just a kind of always that way, you know, we've had connection from the beginning. If we're coming into it later, we really have to be so honest with our children and so respectful of them and, and just say, you know, I've been learning some things and I don't feel happy about the way our relationship is right now. And I, will, I want it to be different. And this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to change. And as soon as they start to really feel that we are making that connection every day, we are giving special time, we're listening, we're accepting their feelings, they want more of that. They really mm. want more, as we all do. Mm. I mean, we're wired for connection. And so as soon as that start, as soon as we do our part of that, they need us. They really do. And I mean, it, you know, depending on how old they are and what the journey's been and how disconnected we are. It can be more work, but either way, it's work. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it, it, even though it may seem scary and we have to take the first steps towards changing direction, they really want that. They do want that. And so it's actually far more effective because as I said, the bigger they get, the less illusion of power we have because it is an illusion, mm -hmm. you know, it really is. But when it's been our primary model in our experience, it's hard to turn and go in another direction for sure. Mm. Many parents ask um, how, so connection, when we say the word connection, it seems so obvious, like we know what it is. And when we have to start to create this connection within our family, we're like, what does that mean? What does that even mean connection? What I'm supposed to do? So how would you describe connection? What does that represent for you? Uh, for me, it represents kind of a mutual caring that we're not only interested in controlling our children's behavior, we're interested in their happiness. One of the things that I always say is that every child needs at least one adult who thinks the sun rises and sets on them is, you know, a hundred loves them unconditionally and has an irrational commitment to their well being. When we have that for our children, and I think parents do, I've never met a parent who really didn't, um, they feel that. They really feel that. And so the way we communicate that is by spending time with the biggest one is spending time with them every day. And, you know, that's difficult. If you have five children and you're how are going to figure out your day to spend a little bit of one-on-one -on -one time with each one of those five children so that they know that we care about them and they're important and what they care about is important to us. We have to really figure that out. It, it, it's not going to happen. It has to be incredibly intentional. And it really has to be our, just the way we feed them every day. It has to be part of the day's agenda. Okay, today I will read to Bobby in the morning. I will play a game with Sally in the afternoon. You know, we find those little pockets of time throughout the day because it doesn't need to be a big amount of time. It just needs to be regular. I mean, daily is ideal, 
but not more than a couple days should go by when we haven't had that, you know, connection time together. It could be reading together. It could be taking a walk. It doesn't have to be some big thing. It can just be that they get to be the one who's special for that amount of time, especially when there are more than one, you know, when there's Mm -hmm. several children, they're all vying to be number one and to be special. So when we provide that, we're creating connection because they know we care because we're taking that time with them. How do we know that we are in connection? So let's say I'm like, because all parents love their children, right? There is no discussion about it. Like we all love our children, but we still have all those agendas in our head, all those expectations. And then somehow it gets in our way and between us and our children there are like those programs agendas expectations (laughs) so what it look like to be in connection with our children when like there are those expectations in the middle okay probably an uh, an easier way to look at it is what does it look like when we're not in connection? (laughs) Mm -hmm. And we can always tell if we have said or done or not done something that's making a child feel disconnected from us. Mm -hmm. And the way that we can tell that is that they will do one or all three of these things. They won't talk to you. They won't look at you. They won't make eye contact and they don't want you to touch them. If they're doing one or two or all three of those things, then we know there's a disconnect somewhere. Because when we're connected, you know, we look in each other's eyes, we talk with each other, we hug, you know, we're connected. And so if if we feel that coming from the child is the time that we need some grace (laughs) and to say, I can tell that you're not feeling okay with us or that you're feeling hurt. Can you tell me what's hurting you? And they won't always be able to, even if they have language, they won't always be able to tell us. But if we can just, you know, be there and just listen and try to reconnect with them by spending time with them or listening to what's hurting them, sometimes they'll be glad to tell us. And I mean, sometimes those are the more passive ways that they let us know that things aren't okay. There are more aggressive ways that they let us know that things are not okay. They might be screaming. They might be trying to hit us. They might be trying to run away from us. So it can go either way, depending on the nature and personality of the child, how they communicate that disconnection with us. So if we, you know, I call it in my book, rewind, repair, replay. You know, if we say, whoa, wait a minute, things are not okay. I, and, you know, we recognize, you know, I didn't listen to you or what I said was hurtful to you and apologize and say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And that can sound, that can feel really difficult for a parent to say to a child, I'm sorry, will you forgive me for being controlling authoritarian, any of those things, but we're modeling that too, when we do that. And so they will see that, oh, when I do something that's not okay, this is how I mend it. This is how I fix it. And so then go back and ask for it. Let's do that over again. Okay, you wanted to go somewhere and I said, no, you know, let's talk about that. Is there a way that we can both get what we need? And as soon as we open that up, the the crack starts, you know, it, it, it gets back together again, that crack in the relationship, it starts to mend. And so then we can tell if we've mended it because then they will talk to us. They will look at us. They welcome our touch. I always tell parents, if you really want to know, ask your child to dance with you. <laughs> if they will dance with you, you're back. The connection is repaired because that involves all of those things, really. So that, that kind of gives a picture of how we know. But that's where it gets scary because when we are like, yeah, but if I start to apologize, there are no boundaries anymore. That means my children can do whatever they want. And how do I manage that? Like, oh my gosh, all the power now is in their hands. (laughs) Oh, I see. You know, it, that is a point of confusion often that people will confuse connection parenting with permissive parenting. Mm-hmm. 
And it's anything but that really, because we're really not doing our children any favor when we're permissive. And, you know, authoritarian parenting is based on fear. It's based on the child's fear of losing the parent's love. And very often permissive parenting is also based on fear, but it's based on the parent's fear of losing the child's love, which is just about impossible to do really. And so, you know, if a child does act in those ways that they're yelling or trying to hit you, you know, we're not gonna let them do that. You know, we're gonna say, this is not okay. And this is not how people who love each other speak to each other. So set, we will set boundaries. You know, we all need that for safety as well as connection. And so it isn't about there are no limits, there are no rules at all. It's about how do we have limits and rules in a loving, respectful way, I think is a better way to put it. So we definitely still, you know, we have to have that in order for them to learn how to be in the world, you know, that we do this or we don't do that. But one of the biggest ways we teach that is by what we model, not by what we order or command mm -hmm. is by what we model. So when we model saying, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Let's, let's do this over again. You know, a few days later, you might hear them saying that to their sibling. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have just taken your toy. You know, let's start over because we're modeling that and they want to be just like us. So they, they don't always do what we tell them, but they always do what we do. Mm, yeah, that's so true. <laughs> so can we uh, like picture a scene, let's say we are in a supermarket and our child sees a toy and then he wants it right now and right here. And we're like, no, that's not why we came here. And then he starts, you know, screaming, he is unhappy. He might push us. How do we set boundaries and keep the connection? Good question. <laughs> well, I'll say two things about that. One is if we're doing daily connection time, their love cup, which I talk about, you know, how they feel connected and loved, is ideally not empty. And if we're listening to their feelings when they have upset, instead of shutting them down and letting them empty that out. So essentially, if we're keeping the love cup full, the hurts cup empty, when we find ourselves in a situation like that, it won't be as volatile. But if we find ourselves in a situation like that, when their hurts cup is brimming over already, their love cup is very empty, that's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> And probably the best we can do if we find ourselves in that circumstance is go to the car, you know, leave the car, whatever, go to the car, listen to their feelings, let them have those, you know, upset feelings that they, they have no control over and they can't hear us when, when they're in that state. So no matter what we say to them, it's not going to, you know, talk them out of feeling that way. We'll probably just have to leave. But you know, we've kind of set ourselves up for that situation unwittingly. If we've let the love cup get that empty and we've let the hurts cup get that full, and then we're in a situation where, you know, they're just trying to stuff those feelings. They're just not feeling loved. So having this toy would stuff down those feelings of hurt and it would make me feel loved. So I must have it. I must, must. And so that's how we get there. And so trying to figure out, okay, how do we get out? <laughs> so I, I would say before we have to go someplace where that could be a scenario, it's best to make sure where everything is at with that child and not put that child or us in that kind of vulnerable situation. But it will happen. And like I said, the best I can think of is just to start over, go to the car, listen to feelings. And it might work to go back in that day and it might not. And so all the more incentive to do the other two things of listening to their hurts and let them get them out and making sure that love cup gets filled with one-on-one -on -one special time of even five minutes a day. Yeah. Hmm. What if the child is a little bit older, let's say he's like eight or nine or 10 and he would come back from school and would say, I don't want to do my homework. Like I just, I'm not gonna do it. How do we 
<laughs> navigate through that. <laughs> right. Well, and that's also a great question. Like, are you gonna? How are you gonna make them? You know, and if you're going to try, if coercion is going to be the way you choose to parent, how are you going to make an eight or nine year old sit and do that? It, it's really not possible unless you really put fear in them, the or else, and, you know, unless they're going to lose all their privileges or they're going to, you know, we have to really up the game of mm. coercion. Mm. And so from the connection direction, <laughs> You know, it would be like, sounds like you had a rough day at school. Do you want to tell me about it? And if you think about what happens for children all day in school, many little hurts could happen all day long. And it's not a safe place to cry or get angry. So they just keep stuffing it in and stuffing it in. So by the time they get home, which is their safe place, and the first thing that happens that's adding to their pile of hurt, mm. that's when we're going to hear about it. And that's when they're likely to fall apart or be really resistant. So probably the first place to go is sounds like you had a rough day at school. Do you want to talk about it? Mm. Or, well, let's not do homework right now. It sounds to me like maybe we need some special time and homework can wait for a while. And again, it's not going to that place of because I said so, you will do it now because I'm the parent and you're the child. <laughs> because if we really think about it, we do not have that power. You know, we're going to take their hand and their pen, and, you know, we can't do that. Mm. So if we can address both needs, which are always underlying any behavior is there's either hurt, there are either hurts in there that are needing to come out before they can move forward, or they're just so on empty that we just need to put some love in that cup so that they can move forward. It will, it will always be one of those two things and often both. And especially, oh, especially now, I mean, we have had two years of pandemic, parents yeah. and teachers are, you know, stressed out and, you know, depleted, and children feel that we have that lack of anything to give. And so, you know, they're scared, and they're, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, and they want reassurance. And so they need even more when we have even less to give. This is probably the worst parenting scenario I've known, mm. what we've endured the last two years. And parents have so much less resource. It's, you know, they're not getting to have time for themselves or as a couple, and it's just all need, need, and nobody's cup is getting refilled. It's just stress on top of stress on top of stress, and children are missing their schoolmates. They're not having the childhood that they need. They're not getting to go off and do things. I mean, it, it is really, I think, the hardest parenting circumstance that I've ever known mm. for parents, so you know, probably to think of going in another direction when we feel like we're hanging on by our fingernails might feel pretty daunting. Mm. And so I can understand the reservations that parents would feel about it. But in a, again, all the more reason we need to do it because things are so scary right now. And, you know, children need that reassurance and, and we need that closeness with them too. So in some ways, children being home as much as they have has created a strange situation, even for parents who are trying to do connection parenting, because we think we're with them all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the things I've been saying is proximity does not equal connection. Mm -hmm. Just because we're under the same roof doesn't mean we're connecting with them. What's happening a lot is everyone goes off to their own screen you know, to do things. And then nobody's connecting with anyone, even though they're all under the same roof. So just planning like no screens at mealtime or, you know, having family reading time, or even if it is watching a show that, you know, we're going to make some popcorn and we're all going to have a movie together. You know, we need to do that. We, we need it so much. And it's just you know, trying to go in that direction, always of connection, if we just always come back to connection. Mm. And, you know, that will get us to where we need to go, which is having cooperation. And, you know, one of the quotes from my book that I see a lot is the level of cooperation that parents get from their children is usually equal to the level of connection children feel with their parents. And we achieve that connection by filling the love cup and listening to the hurts cup. 
So, I mean, it, it's simple, but not easy at <laughs> <Yeah>. all, especially <laughs> when all of our experience and all of our recordings are the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, I often have parents make a list of all the things that they want to give their children mm-hmm. and all the things that they know they don't want to give their children. And then I ask them to go back and put a check mark next to all the things they want to give their children that they themselves got and put a check mark on all the things that they don't want to give their children that they got and put a check mark. And almost always there are way more check marks on the don't want side and fewer on the do want side. So it's really hard to give what we didn't get. And it's really hard not to do what was done to us. So it's, it's not an easy direction to turn around, but once we see the fruit of it, once we see what it feels like when that connection is happening, it it's, um, encourages us to keep going. And I always tell parents, you can't just make a decision, okay, I am going to do connection parenting, and that's it. It's a decision that we have to make a thousand times a day. I am going to choose connection. And sometimes we won't. We'll just automatically do coercion. And then we'll see the disconnection and we'll be like, whoa, we have to rewind, repair, replay, because it is going to happen. Um, There was a quote that I always love that we will always be parenting in the gap. Mm -hmm. of between the parenting we aspire to, the way we want to do it, and what comes naturally to us. We'll Mm -hmm. always be in that gap because what comes naturally to us is not connection parenting because it's not what we experience for most of us. And so we'll always be trying to bridge that gap. And we'll, we'll have setbacks, you know, it will happen that we'll just be on automatic or we'll be overstressed, you know, because our love cup is empty and our hurts cup is full. So Mm. we have to have resources. We really can't take this on alone. Parenting never used to be, was never, ever intended to be a one or two person job. And that's why the pandemic has hit parenting so hard because if we were successful in creating a village for, you know, whether it's family of choice or family of origin, we have to create that village so that our children have more than just us to fill their love cup and that we have resource so that we can go get our cup refilled and then come back and give some more. So we've, that's been taken away from so many parents, that support mm-hmm. system between quarantine and you know, all of the people being ill, losing family members, all that support has been stripped away. And it's, it's a really hard struggle without that support. Absolutely is. And parents are probably going to resort to coercion when there's just, you know, when, when connection just feels too hard, Mm because it's what comes naturally to us. Because we are tired of ourselves, and we don't have, you know, our cup is also empty, if we don't Mm -hmm. care we don't take care of ourselves so yeah it's really hard and but I love um what you said about you know those moments they don't have to be very long in time so those can be very like brief short but special moments with children can we talk a little bit about that special time what does that mean how does it look a special time is going to look different depending on the age of the child you know if it's a little baby and we're bouncing them on our knee and singing to them and patty cakes you know that's special time Mm -hmm. you know if it's a toddler and we're playing run and chase games I'm going to come find you they adore that that's special time you know um it can be playing a game with them it can, my favorite form of special time is reading aloud with children. Mm. And it always has been. I mean, I currently, and we can talk more about this, I currently have a literacy project. But even before I did any of that with my children and with my grandchildren, the reading was always the way that we would connect the most strongly. And when you do read a lot together, you develop kind of a language of jokes that were from a certain book or a way that you say something that was from a book you shared and those are kind of like links in a chain that keep us connected you know when you say um 
Oh, there's a there's a book series that the children love today called Mercy Watson. And it's about a pig who loves toast with a great deal of butter. And so all you have to do is say to a child that you've read those stories to again and again, let's have toast with a great deal of butter. And I mean, it's just instant connection. It's just instant cup filling. It's really beautiful. Yes, I love it. There is something special about reading with kids because I, um, I read a lot to my children and we kind of travel because you start with a story and then I love asking questions like what would you have done in the same situation or what do you think about you know this character or would you be friends with you know the the, the person from the book and they start talking about they you know how they see the world what's yeah. the reality how they live in it and it's so it's so rich I mean, it's, those are most precious moments for me. They, they are. And I mean, books, especially picture books, give us that opening to talk about anything we want or need to talk about. You know, sometimes there are things that are hard to talk about. And if we just get a book that in any way references that, it opens that door to discussion. And like you said, well, whoa, whoa, would you be friends with him? Or, yeah. you know, I don't really love children's books that are kind of head on of like, you know, did you say thank you? You know, that sort yeah. of thing that are, they're designed to teach a moral lesson or something like that. I'm, I'm not a fan of those kind of books, but I love books where there's a problem, you know, and something gets solved and they see how other people deal with things. And even if it's something scary, like fairy tales, a lot of fairy tales are pretty scary, mm -hmm. but it's over there. And so they get to sort of experience it far enough away that it doesn't scare them too much, but it's just enough that they want to peek out and say, what would I do in that situation? Or what are they going to do in that situation? So it is so rich. Like you said, it is just so rich way to spend time together so i'm a major read aloud advocate for sure yes um i hear so many parents say that you know in when we try to establish uh, a connection with their children they struggle because they don't feel connected to themselves i would say mm. How does that work? Can we be connected to our children if we are not connected to ourselves? To a point, I think you can. You, you can fake it. <laughs> to, you know, I mean, it's like we don't always feel like making a meal, but we do it. So it might not be the meal that's prepared with great love, but we're, they're still getting fed. So it tells us we have some work to do on our own issues. Mm. And I mean, again and again, I see everywhere that the best thing we can do for our children is to heal ourselves. And I think there's a lot of truth in that, that we can't parent well from a place of hurt. And so nothing will bring up our own childhood hurts more than having our own children. So mm. our children really are the prescription <laughs> for you know where those places are that we have some healing work to do and again that's more reason for us to have more resource so that we have time one of the things i've always said it isn't until we have children that we're really so aware of all those things that we carry and then we don't have time to work on them because we're so busy trying to meet their needs and not pass those hurts on to them it's like wow, this is really hard. And so it keeps coming back to needing that support of extended family, of creating a village of choice, because we do need to do that work. But in order to do it, someone needs to be with the children and, you know, while we're doing that. So it's really both. So yes, we can do connection to a certain level when we're still struggling with those things, for sure but it will be richer and deeper when we can come from a place of joy than, than it will be from when we're coming from a place of survival, for mm. sure. Yeah. How open can we be with our children? Like, do we have to, because another fear from parents is like, but this connection of children, it's like we're on the same level. So I, I 
do, do I have to tell them everything? Like, do I have to talk about my feelings? Do I have to talk about what I think? How much far should I go into this connection? Wow, that's a really great question. Um, well, I think there's really two things again about that. I mean, we can be honest without going into detail that they're not ready for, and it should never be a child's job to care for the parent, physically or emotionally. Mm. You know, I mean, it's nice that they make breakfast in bed or, you know, help out when we're sick and do extra chores, those sorts of things. But emotionally, we should not unload on our children. It's not their job to be our listener. We need to do that with another adult. That doesn't mean we can't say mommy's really sad today or daddy's pretty angry right now or daddy's very sad today. And, you know, I, I don't really feel like playing right now, but I will. I will. And find another adult that we can talk to and have listen to us or go to a counselor. It's, it's really not our children's job to do that. And at the same time, we need to say, you know, I'm feeling really sad today, or I have a lot of anger right now. And so that because they know anyway, they, you know, <laughs> they know, you know, they can read us like unbelievably. So we need to own that because otherwise we make them think they're crazy if they say, Oh, mommy, what's wrong? And we say nothing, nothing. <laughs> We're fine. What does that teach them to do? Stuff their feelings and pretend everything is fine if we model that. But if we model that it's okay to say I'm sad, it's okay. And it's, you know, people will say, is it okay to cry in front of your children? Mm -hmm. I always say, yes, but just not louder than they cry. You know, we can say, you know, they can see that we're sad, that we have tears, that this is what human beings do when they're sad. We cry, you know, grandma died, whatever has happened. Or I'm, I'm scared about what's happening in the world, but we're all going to do what we can to keep each other safe. I will be here with you. You know, we can give reassurance without making it sound other than it is. Or, yeah, just I think being honest, but not in, and And again, depending on their age level how many details of what's happening we would share. You know, to a younger child, we might say, well, granddad is in the hospital and he's not doing too well and we're paying for him, you know, whatever we would say. But to an older child, we might say, well, there's a problem with his heart and, you know, they're doing some tests. So it's almost kind of like in school, you at each grade you go up, you get more details of what happened in history. It's kind of that way mm -hmm. that at the level they are able to understand. And we need to not underestimate how much they understand because even if they don't understand details, they understand feelings because it's all over our face, it's in our body posture, it's in our voice. So they know when things are not okay with us. And so we need to just say, yeah, I am very worried or yes, I'm very tired <laughs> or you know, I'm very sad. Mm. And equally, I am so happy you know, to make sure that we share that too, you know, mm. to share the joy. We need to share both for sure. That was my next question. If they ask why, how far should we go into explanation? Like, why are you sad, mommy? Or why are you angry? Should we, like, how much information should we provide them with? Well, I think a lot of that too will depend on the level of our connection with them. If their cup is, their hurts cup is pretty empty, if their love cup is pretty full, if they're in pretty good shape going into some trauma or stress, you know, and, you know, again, depending on their age and level of comprehension of things around them, you know, we can say, well, I'm sad because I'm worried that maybe grandpa might die. You know, it's very serious or, and it's a possibility, you know, better that than they come home and you're a wreck and they had no idea that anything was that serious. So I think, you know, in every situation, we have to look at all the circumstances and use our best judgment about how much is appropriate to reveal right now. You know, and if something, you know, if they come home and you are like sobbing, weeping, mm. you know, that's going to be a little bit, you know, scary to them, especially if they've never seen you do that. 
if they've always seen you, you know, cry over a sad movie or, you know, if they've always seen you show your feelings, that won't throw them quite as much. But if they've never seen you cry and now you're really crying, mm -hmm. it's going to be like, whoa, things are not okay. And, you know, to just say, you know, grownups do cry too and, and model that, then that gives them permission to cry. But if they never see us cry, the unspoken message is we don't cry. Hmm. That's the unspoken message. And so they will try to be like us because they want to do everything we do. So I think it's going to be a judgment call in every situation that to, to maybe always own our feelings, but decide how much information about those feelings is appropriate in that circumstance. I love the way you describe it because it's like we don't need like a special occasion for connection like it could be everyday life like each moment in our routine could mm -hmm. be the time for connection yes yep because sometimes we feel this pressure like i need to find time i need to buy something or we need to go <laughs> somewhere you know like it, it has to be this big deal and then we right. can connect but it could happen mm -hmm. like in the kitchen, like in our everyday life, like we don't need anything except two persons, I guess. Yes, you said that. I love the way you said that because it's true. And, and when I said we have to make that decision to, to parent through connection a million times a day. And, you know, there are all those opportunities throughout the day, you know, instead of just pass the butter, you know, at the table, you could say, would you pass me a great deal of butter? You know, just those little jokes, yeah. those little ways that we share things that are special to us. And it could be while they're brushing their teeth or, you know, during the bath. And, you know, there's, as you say, every moment is an opportunity for connection. Mm -hmm. And it, it isn't the big things. Yes, maybe on their birthday, we go to the amusement park or, you know, we do those bigger things. Those are great. Those are fun. But true connection is daily life. It's, it's every moment of the day from the moment they wake up until the last, you know, mm. closing their eyes. It's a way of life. It truly is a way of life. It's like, it, like doing the same we do every day, but not the same thing. I remember like hugging my son in between two calls and was doing like, I finished the call, I hug him, I go back to another call. And then I was like, why? I didn't even like soak it in my body. I was like, you know, like this, like, you know, this automatic gesture, like, oh, mm -hmm. come. And then it, and I was like, no, like I have to see him. I have to smell him. I have to feel him. And the same amount of time, like 10 seconds, I hug, like 10 seconds. Mm -hmm but it could feel so different. Yes, I love that because it makes me think of one time I saw a post on Facebook about a teacher who had a special greeting for each child in the classroom. And every morning as the child came in, they would do this like, you know, special handshake, something. And so I thought, what a great thing that would be for parents to have with each child where there's just some little, you know, touch your nose, something that's like our special connection. And in that 10 seconds or whatever you had, if you had that in place, you could say, you know, or from across the room, you know, just these different little ways that are their special connection with us. What a wonderful thing to have, you know, you're in an airport and it's loud and it's noisy and, you know, you just need to gather in and just make that connection the more ways that we can create. There's a book that I absolutely love. It's called I Love You Rituals. It's by Becky Bailey. And it's just this gold mine of those kinds of things, of those little ways of connecting. And, you know, we would do well to learn as many of them and employ as many of them as we can because they will serve us so well. And it will be so rich for our children because they'll know like, mm -hmm. oh, I know my mom's busy, but she remembered our little special thing. And you're right. It's the same amount of time, but such a richer connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for saying that. 
can we circle back to the reading time? Because we have this wonderful book project. Could you tell yes. us a little bit more I, about it? I would love it. So I'll try to make it brief, but when my great grandson was born, I was writing a letter to my granddaughter telling her how important it would be to read to him starting now, every day, multiple times a day. And somehow that letter that I was writing to her kind of morphed into this poem that was, please read to me. And it felt important to me because parents are inundated with read to your child this many minutes every day, read to your child, you know, kind of like being told what to do. Mm -hmm. And this is in the voice of the child, please read to me. And um, so I thought, well, who would like this poem? Who would want this poem? So I started Googling family literacy sites and on every one I landed on was this statistic that two thirds of the 15.5 million children in the United States do not own even one book. And I was just astounded. I was like, how can this be? I mean, I shop at the thrift shops and the Goodwill and I know how many used books there are out there. And I thought, you know, I can't do anything about poverty as one individual citizen, but I know I can do something about getting books into the homes of children. So I just initiated it. I founded the Book Fairy Pantry Project. And I realized that there are, I mean, children outgrow books every day. There are outgrown books out there. Mm -hmm. And that instead of them being donated to the thrift stores and the, you know, what if they could be donated to the children who need them, who don't have the books? But it, it was like, okay, distribution. How do we get the books from the people who have them to the people who need them? And then it dawned on me, food pantries. Every community here has a food pantry. If we got those books donated to the food pantries instead of to the you know, sale shops, they could be given out for free. If parents can't afford food, they certainly can't afford children's books. This way also the parents get to pick them out and bring them home and give them to the children, which is gonna make them that much more special because the parents have given them to them. And so it has, this was five years ago and it has just grown steadily in the last five years. It's in other countries, it's in other states because of social media, because I have a website of it. You know, people get to hear about it. I have a Facebook page for, for Book Fairy Pantry Project and I, you know, all the time put articles about the importance of reading and, you know, different books that I hear about so that it can be a resource for families. And it's just the joy of my life. And people will say, well, how did you get from connection parenting to literacy? <laughs> and I say, there really is such a strong bridge between the two because the strongest, quickest way I know of to connect with a child is to read aloud to them. Mm. And my, I have two heroes in this project. One is Dolly Parton with her imagination library who gets free books to children worldwide. In fact, my poem that I wrote about, it was my dream for five years to turn that into a board book for children. And it's now published. It is a board book for children and it's dedicated to Dolly Parton. My other hero of why it's so important to get books to children is Mem Fox and her book, Reading Magic. And, you know, it's just such a joy to me to be part of something that changes children's lives because whether or not children learn to read is going to affect their standard of living, their whole quality of life and learning to read should be a human right. But they can't read if they don't have books. And it's just such an easy thing to do. Children are happy to pass on their outgrown books. And so we say that, you know, what we give out are books from children for children. So, and they, it's really like a social justice issue, you know, that they get to do something really big as children that makes a difference in the world mm -hmm. by donating their outgrown books. And we have built some little free libraries during the pandemic beginning when the libraries were closed and the schools were closed. Children who had no books in their home had no access to books. So we were blessed with having a couple of them made and put into neighborhoods that didn't have many resources so that there were books for the whole family suddenly 24 seven. And it's just the most exciting thing I've really ever been part of. And everybody in our community is supporting it. We've had publishers donate brand new books to us. 
we have people who literally will go online and shop for books and have them sent to us for children. Most of what we give out are gently used books that have been donated. And it's grown from the food pantries now to we give them to children that through WIC, which is uh, Women, Infants and Children program, um, through the early Head Start and Head Start, anywhere that there might be children with no books, we, we donate books. So, and I mean, there are many similar um, projects in the country, but um, for us, I'm in Maine. And so it's pretty regional. I mean, this is where we're centered, but because of social media, it's getting out there into the world and it's set up completely that anyone can start one anywhere and it's their project. We're just the model of how to do it and support and coaching. So it, it, I'm pretty excited about it. So I get lots of opportunities to do author visits now that I can claim being a children's author, which is my most exciting title. And uh, it's just so sweet to go to schools and be able to, you know, read to them. And mm -hmm. I also was a volunteer at a local elementary school working with first graders who were struggling to read. And I, you know, I just thought, I don't want children to have to struggle to read because we know if children are read aloud enough, read to enough, before they ever start school, their foundation for learning to read will be so much stronger. And, you know, just to read a couple stories a day will do it. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's not a difficult thing to do. So getting books into the home is really what makes me get up every day and do what I do. I love it. It's such a lovely project. I um, I witnessed at home some scenes when kids would come to play with my children. And let's say they would be sad that day or angry, you know, and I don't know how, but a few times we kind of settled in, you know, on a sofa with some books and they would read to each other. Like, you know, like one children to another one. And there's this connection, you know, around books, like looking to the, some pictures, you know, like reading aloud, doing some comments. And Sorry, my uh, phone is ringing in the background. <laughs> okay, yes, continue. Yeah, I can hear it. Do I'm sorry. No, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, and it's so, that was so lovely. Like this kind of natural empathy through books, through reading. Like I can see you are sad. Like you, are, I, I can feel you sad today. Like let's read together. And we have tons of books. As you say, they are like outgrown. We don't read them anymore. And right. so many times it was like, where should we, Put them like you know like mm -hmm. and this is such a lovely idea like to give those books to those who don't have it even if that's like what like who doesn't have books nowadays but you know like it, apparently there are many there are many families houses where mm -hmm. this is not the case and you know what upset me most about that too is that means so Two thirds of the 15.5 million, that's 10 million children going to bed every night with no bedtime story. Mm -hmm. That beautiful opportunity for connection at the end of the day doesn't happen. So every time I see books go into a home, I think that's changing that whole home mm -hmm. because now they will have that at night. They will have that way to connect. Yeah. And it just makes me so happy that it's such a gift, you know, for them to have those. And they're free. So I talk about beginning to end illiteracy for free because they're all donated. It's all volunteer. It's a totally grassroots organization. It's all volunteer. It's all donations. I mean, we do sometimes get financial support, but mostly it's, it's donations and volunteers who deliver the books, who clean the books, who sort the books. And it, it's just amazing that we can do that on surplus on things that just would either get thrown out or sent to resale that we can give those away and change children's experience of life and, and prepare also, them for school it's also about how good people are and that's why connection matters right because without connection if we feel disconnected we don't have this kindness towards others because we right. might feel resentful and angry 
but then we feel connected. We are like naturally good. We, we, we want to do good to others. Yeah, we do. And for children to start that young, knowing they can make a difference in the world by what they can give, you know, it, it, for it to start that early, that this is what we do as human beings. We help each other and support each other and to start that really, really young. And, you know, I see parents, you know, take their children along to volunteer to serve meals at the, at the soup kitchens. And, you know, those kinds, it's another way of doing that, of, that we can do service. And when children grow up with that, it's just the way life is for them to learn that so early. And they can learn that from so many stories that, you know, there's just so many beautiful children's books that not because the book is preaching it, but the example of the characters in the book, you know, living life in that way of being compassionate, of having empathy and having forgiveness and all of those qualities that we, we want to model and promote for our children are in children's books. I always tell people, oh, there is a book called Everything I Needed to Know I Learned from a Little Golden Book. <laughs> and, you know, there's so much truth in that because, you know, they're not preachy or telling people what to do, but they're just stories about how people had a situation and this is how they handled it. And so children can experience it from afar and look at it. And like you were saying, oh, would I do that? Or would I be friends with that person? Or is this the way I would want something to be? And it's so safe to do it when the story's over here. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, for this lovely conversation. Oh, I it's been wonderful. Like, I feel blessed for having you here with us. Thank you. Oh, I feel blessed to share this time with you. Have a good hey. day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.